Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Pablo Cerdera, and I have the honor of being able to introduce um, and welcome our speaker today, Dr. Gerda Smith Campy, um, who is a leading scholar in the field of informatics and the study of random field networks. Um, this is intended to be the second in the exhibition initiatives um, lecture series, the Post Internet is Dead lecture series. The first, um, as you may know, was canceled due to illness. Uh, Dr. Camden unexpectedly fell ill. You'll be happy to hear that she's expected to make a full recovery. Um, so, uh, Dr. Dr. Smith Campy is the Wester Scholar in Residence at the Gershwin H. Lester Institute. Um, he studied uh, undergrad at the University of Ontario and attended graduate school at the New Newton Future School at Stanford and he studied spontaneous distributed networks. He went, on, he went on to pioneer the study of dialectical informatics and is a leading leftist scholar in information technology and brings to us tonight over 40 years of experience in the field. So tonight's talk is about the shifting technological landscape um, and the impacts that that has on uh, the opportunity to create a sort of new dialectic in the 21st century. So I hope that everyone can join me in welcoming uh, our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that welcome. Thank you all for being here. I know it's a, a Friday night and you uh, cause kids love drinking. Uh, but yes, uh, everything that um, uh, the, the young man who introduced uh, me said is true. Uh, and I'm very excited to go share this with you. I'm sure you've read a little bit about this on the Facebook event, um, on the posters that uh, you know, uh, my friends here have been so nice to post around campus. And I just want to thank Exhibition Initiative for uh, making it possible for me to be here today. And then also uh, you know, thank, of course, the Gershwin H. Lester Institute, my employer, uh, where uh, you know, they also helped uh, bring me here today. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get started with this talk once I you know, hook up this projector. It's funny, I, I study technology, but, but not like this. <laughs> well, this will just have to do. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, I'm talking about dialectical materialism, which is a Marxist philosophical framework, and then um, relating that to the concept of the Internet of Things, which I don't know if you know about. It's a, it's a big buzzword uh, down there in Silicon Valley, which is just you know a few hundred miles south of the Gershwin H. Lester Institute. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background um, and the Institute, and then we'll go right on and we'll deal with uh, dialectical materialism, and then uh, after that, the Internet of Things and how they can relate and how we can move forward from that. All right, so uh, the Gershwin H. Lester Institute for Virtual Studies is where I have been employed for I would say about 20 years now. Um, it, it, it started uh, out of a discussion group that um, Gershwin H. Lester, a DARPA researcher who was very, very interested in all these changes uh, and what they would uh, bring to uh, humanity as a whole. So he was one of the um, original researchers on ARPANET, the precursor to the internet. And so, um, you know, very early on, he and some other researchers, also his friends, other people from around the area, they, um, they would get together around his kitchen table and they would discuss this. And they would figure out, you know, think about like, how is this going to change this? You know, now we have electronic mail, like what will that do? All this stuff, and there's a lot of really great, um, a lot of really great stuff come out of that. And if you uh, actually have archives from those early conversations and then eventually it became a newsletter as the group sort of spread across the country and those are all um, in our institute. Um, if you're ever in the neighborhood, um, uh, you should definitely check it out. Uh, we also have many of those documents online in our virtual archive, which we are still um, working to uh, get totally scanned in and up there. Um, but uh, you know, we do have internships, so I know you college students love internships. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, please talk to me, email me, or email the institute, and you know, we have plenty of work that needs to be done. So. Dialectical materialism. That's yeah, Marx, you know, he's the big boy when it comes to dialectical materialism. You know, it's pretty much, uh, it's his deal, although I will say, you know, 
he, he did good, but uh, there's been a lot of thought since then, you know, a lot of really great, you know, neo-Marxist scholars, I consider myself one of them. I consider, you know, Gershwin H. Lester in his own way was one of them. You know, uh, let plenty, many, many people, even Mark Zuckerberg has actually written a few treatises of his own, which, um, you know, I have my own issues with. Uh, there's definitely a very large neoliberal bent throughout the whole piece. Uh, sorry, that's not what I uh, came here to talk about today, though. <laughs> so what dialectical materialism is, in case you don't know, although I'm sure, you know, what, what do you have the core curriculum, you read Das Kapital, I'm not sure. But it, it can be a little bit confusing, but it's actually very simple, so uh, we'll just jump right in. So what it is, is it's basically it's a dialectical framework, which we'll go into uh, very shortly, with materialist base. Um, and you can use it to both understand the world around us and then also understand how we understand the world around us. So, dialectics. It's a philosophical tool commonly associated with the, um, the old Greeks, you know, you know, the good old boys of philosophy. Plato, he's a big one, woo! Um, <laughs> yeah, but actually, uh, one thing to know about dialectics is that it's not just a Greek thing. Um, it was also a very, very important part of um, Indian philosophy. And I would say, uh, I hope you'll with me once I explain it a little bit more, uh, that it is really, I think, one of the most human uh, tools that we have. And it's a kind of root with how we understand the world, no matter what our background is, what we are trying to do, what our views are on how the world works. We are be we materialists, idealists, it doesn't matter. So. Uh, Dialectics, you know, sounds a lot like dialogue, and it's because it's basically the same thing. So the way dialogue works is that you have, you know, uh, person one, and you know they they think you know oh the sky is blue, and then you have person two, and they say. <laughs> There is no sky. <laughs> so there is this disagreement. And you know, this, this is how it differs from maybe a, a debate is that there's an assumption of a kind of good faith on both parties that what they are is, is not trying to, you know, while they're both, you know, person one is trying to convince person two that the sky is blue, and person two is trying to convince person one that there is no sky, what they both are after is not uh, you know, the, their ultimate ideological victory, but in fact a better understanding of the sky itself. <laughs> um, and so, a, a sort of dialectic method to resolve this issue and come to a further, new, better understanding is that they would um, each say their reasoning and they would discuss and they would debate and they say, this is what I think, this is why I think it, and say, this is why you're wrong. And so then, from that, the dialectics leads to uh, a new, uh, hypothesis. Um, as you may or may not know, um, in philosophy we like to say there's only hypotheses, never facts, <laughs> nothing can be proven. So that's basically dialectics. Um, but it, the way that Marx uses dialectics is a little bit different, um, and we'll go on to that now. But first, take a little bit stop, a bit of a stop in the way with Hegel. <laughs> um, I've always been a big fan of Hegel because so much, you know, you saw Marx, you saw Plato, they have these big beards, and for so long I thought, the beard, that must be where the brain is, and I, I tried very hard to grow one, but with little success, so it's nice to see someone, you know, who definitely, you know, he's got a brain up there, uh, uh, but no beard down there. But, so Hegel, Hegel's actually very important, not just to Marx's dialectics, but to Marx in general. Uh, Marx was a Hegelian scholar in school, uh, Hegel was a very important influence, and you know, he had a very complicated relationship with Hegel. As, you know, I'm sure you've all been there with a friend or an advisor or a professor where you know, some of their ideas, they just, they just drive you up a wall, but also you know, that's some really great things. They were a really key foundational part of you know, your intellectual growth and development. And so that was Hegel for Marx. And so Hegel tried to come up with this Hegelian dialectics, although he did not use that term to sort of, in this attempt to study um, things in their own being and they would try to understand what things were. And so there's this idea of thesis and antithesis, and then that being used to synthesize a new thesis. It's like, you know, the sky is blue, there is no sky, and you need to synthesize a new hypothesis. You know, um, there is no blue sky, perhaps. <laughs> um, so that's uh, basically the gist of Hegelian dialectics. One important thing is that um, Hegelian dialectics were an idealist dialectics. 
which is a, a key distinction between that and materialist dialectics. So uh, an idealist philosophy or, or viewpoint or metaphysics is one where you believe that nothing exists except for ideas in the minds, and you know there is no table here except for how we would understand this table in our own heads and the idea of a table, and that is what makes it real. Something that Marx vehemently disagrees with, and that is the main source of Marx's disagreement with Hegel. So materialism, um, it is basically the, uh, the contrast of um, idealism. So instead of saying there is nothing except for our own thoughts, that's the only thing we know, materialism says that there are, there are things, there is this table, you know, there is the sky, there are atoms, and furthermore, there is nothing else. Everything can come down to the interaction of atoms. As um, Thomas Hobbes would say, humans are simply matter in motion, and Marx would certainly agree with that. Um, and so, uh, that's basically what materialism is, and that's where Marx is coming from. He rejects the sort of idealistic philosophy. He thinks it's way too, you know, pie in the sky, you know, too unrealistic, and most importantly, not applicable enough. Philosophers at this point, he thought, had been too far into their own world, too much of doing ideology for its own sake, and not understanding ideology and the way it could be used as a tool. So, dialectical materialism. Basically, what it is, is ideology does not shape reality. You do not come in with an ideology, like say, you do not believe that, you know, uh, what, would be a, what would be a good one? An ideology that someone has, a political one. Anarchy. Anarchy. So yeah, you could come in and say that I believe that the state is wrong and everything about the state is wrong. It does damage, it does this, it does that, it does the other thing. And then you say, I want that to shape the way we think about this, not the way we think about the state, but the way we actually use the state and construct states and things like that. And so what Marx would say was that is not how it works. Instead, what it is is we come into this and we have this state around us and that is what shapes our views of the state. And so if we want to change the way that society as a whole thinks about the state in this one example, we would need to first change the state, not change what people think. It's a very action-oriented philosophy. It's very, very much about action. It's very, very much for Marx wrapped up with class struggle and working to liberate the working class. Um, so that's basically dialectical materialism. One interesting aside is the um, concept of uh, the dialectic view of history, which kind of uh, is important to uh, actually kind of goes back to some other sort of uh, deeper Hegelian dialectic concepts. But basically, that humanity uh, you can look at the entire history of human society as this dialectic, this conversation as between a system uh, that there then develops contradictions within it, which will lead to revolution and the overthrow of the new system, of the old system and the creation of a new system. So you have um, Roman society with patriarchs and plebeians, they overthrow, and you get to move on, you know, eventually it's feudal society where you have aristocrats and peasants and there's an overturn to the contradiction of that society, and you get modern bourgeois society where you have um, capitalists and uh, the proletariat. And so that's the dialectic moving forward onto more and more productive societies. It's very much driven also by material needs and the history of productions. It's all very, very good stuff. Um, Marx, he certainly had a brain in his head as well as his beer on that one. That's all <laughs> I gotta say. But so that's dialectical materialism. So, uh, this is an interesting aside. The internet is inherently dialectic. I don't know how much you do know about the way that the internet works, but um, it works very, very badly. A lot worse than you would know. Um, so there's a protocol that's used to transmit data through these networks called TCP slash IP. And so it exists to solve this problem, which is the internet is not like a pipe. If it is a pipe, it's a pipe with lots of holes in it. <laughs> this is not a joke. Every time that you send a message from one computer to another computer, it fails a lot. Things get lost. Things get corrupted. And so, if the internet was ever going to be viable, they need to construct a system that would account for this, which is how do you take something that is uh, very unpredictable, not reliable at all, and <laughs> construct upon that a reliable system. And so that's what TCIP does by uh, means of communicating from your computer, and this computer says, yes, I received the data, I received it like this, and it goes back and forth, um, communicating, going back and forth, a dialectics, if you will, about the data that is being sent 
from one computer to the other until they had made sure that the data that the computer had received was the data that the first computer meant to um, send. So um, from the very start, the internet is a dialectic process both on the very, very strict technical level, but also as I'm sure you've known just from using it, it's uh, very, very inherent to the way we use it today. So the concept of the internet of things. Uh, in fact, for this, I will let a, um, a video that I have from the uh, good or not so good folks over at Intel about this. And I'm afraid the sound is not working, but uh, there's some text on the screen, and I can help you along the way. <laughs> so now they're talking about all these different things, your smartphone, your home, your workplace, some sort of machinery <coughs> being connected, and getting statistics about all those machinery. Statistics is very important for the internet machines. You have all these different machines, all connected, all giving each other statistics. Connected devices become an intelligent system of systems. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so the system can share the data and analyze it. And so you have this data from all sorts of things, not just your computer, but also your home, also the factories, also everything. And they say this is the potential to transform business and everything. You have a car, you have this machine. You know, it's doing its production thing, maybe making an Intel chip, going up and down, doing your purchases, looking at the energy, getting the energy statistics, learning everything. This computer, this new Internet of Things, is all this data. Hmm. Hmm. Detecting congestion, accidents, weather. Sending this information to some sort of large system that coordinates the Internet of Things, the city tap camera system, from that, to the city transportation system. And then from that, it can give you all sorts of things. They have the example of, say, if there was a lot of traffic, they would delay when the airplane took off so that people could um, enter the traffic, or enter the airplane, uh, accounting for the traffic. So it's all about analyzing this data, using this data, connecting everything. And what's very, very important is that it allows, in their mind, for a lot more productivity. And that is key. Mm. So the little dots are the numbers zooming around. There's the, the plane getting the numbers also. Goes to the school. Something about school buses like going off earlier or later. And I didn't understand that part when it did. <laughs> you know, smart traffic signs. And here's the important thing, which is that we have these things now. We have, if you've ever driven on a major road sometimes, you see these big signs put up. Sometimes they put them up just for emergencies. Sometimes they're always there. That gives you data like 20 minutes to I-80, you know, 20 minutes to the Brooklyn Bridge, whatever it is. And they have this information here. So what is different is that this is being automated. There's no one who has to collect these reports, figure it out, and make these decisions, make these calls. It's all done automatically, you know, preferably on Intel processors. Hmm. Um, yeah, so now here it's a little bit of a, a whole blah, 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 Intel, Intel thing. But uh, hopefully that gives you a good idea of what the Internet of Things is. And now we will talk about how uh, dialectics comes into that. So the goals of a company like Intel, like Silicon Valley, the people who pioneered this term Internet of Things, Google, you know, if you've ever seen that thermostat commercial, the Nest thermostat, I wanted to bring that up here, uh, the commercial, but I, I just didn't get it on here on time. This computer is a little bit old and weird. It's my travel computer, I'm sorry. Um, but, so the goals of these corporate giants, Google, Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera, is a greater sophistication of the world as a whole. It is the alienation of of not only, as we've seen throughout capitalism, if you're familiar with Art Marx, the alienation from the worker and the means of production, but in fact, increasing alienation from humanity to humanity, and increasing alienation from humanity and the work it does in the larger context of that work. And what it all is overall about is about the mechanization of humanity, which is about each human being perfectly optimized via this system. Data is collected, feedback is given, um, you know, the person adjusts themselves accordingly, and most importantly, this is all done automatically, this mechanization. Um, so, 
that sounds pretty good to some extent. I mean, not, not the alienation, um, you know, not Google being in charge, but the kind of idea of a very efficient society where you have a... <laughs> machine I think should be appealing to everyone but that is not to say that it is not without issues so um, the reality is is that at this point it's too late to fight the idea of the Internet of Things that would be counter to Marx's, Marx's idea of dialectical materialism the material is here we are cyborgs I'll explain in a minute in a minute so we cannot use our ideology, our anti-cyber, anti-technology ideology to shape that. It's too late, that has happened. So instead, we have to understand what the reality is and then from that, construct a new ideology and use that to shape the future. <coughs> so we're not maybe cyborgs in the traditional sense, most of us. Maybe <laughs> we have a pacemaker, uh, whatever. Some people put some chips in their skin. You know, that's their business. Um, but uh, the reality is, is that functionally, we grow closer and closer to cyborgism every day. Um, I remember um, uh, my daughter, uh, she, you know, she grew up with uh, much more of this computerized stuff than I did. And so she, uh, you know, did uh, uh, the AOL, like the, the chat thing. Um, a lot, all the time, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Being connected is fine. But um, I, I've had long conversations with her about this, and she's gotten to this place where, you know, for her, it's very, very similar now with the, um, the smartphones to be kind of always connected. You know, you always can talk to your friends, your friends can talk to you. If you have something you want to think about, uh, you want to know about, you search the Wikipedia. Um, it's great, I think that's an amazing thing. It's not bad at all, but it leads to this new connection that we have with each other, as if we all had a little bit of a, a chip in our brains, you know, hooked up to the internet, a clunk, um, <laughs> like that. You know, sure, it's, it's not functionally equivalent, or, you know, exactly equivalent. It's not like we, we don't have anything inside of us. It's not all the time, it's not while we sleep. We can put our phones down, they're not connected to us. But practically, it's very, very similar. We have access to this information basically whenever we want, wherever we want. And, um, uh, you know, so I would say the cyborg, cyborgification of humanity, and again, this is a certain subset of humanity, but I'm gonna get to that in a second, is basically here, it's happening. And uh, to fight it is futile. And so now this comes to the question, well, is everyone becoming a cyborg? Not everyone agrees with this. Some people say, well, look at, you know, the, what is it? I think it was the last figure, uh, 1.3 billion people without regular electricity use. You know, what about them? Are they cyborgs yet? And the answer is maybe not yet, but it's happening. And it's happening in a very, very, um, at least if you're concerned about the plight of, of of people as a whole, of humanity, and of these people who currently don't have access to the internet, these vulnerable people, if you're worried about that, it's happening in a very, very bad way. And so I'm gonna show this next video um, from Facebook's uh, new Endeavor company thing, internet.org. So I think there's really not a lot of text, so I'll just narrate this. So it's talking about, oh, isn't the internet so good? Look at all these things we've accomplished with the internet. We're so connected. The internet happens. You know, oh, discoveries, science, this stuff. Oh, you talk to your friends, you talk to your grandma, your grandma, you know, learns about nuclear physics on Wikipedia. Amazing. You, know, oh, you have an event, you publicize it. You know, people come, amazing. So, but you know, wouldn't it be really great if everyone had the internet? Like what? You know, what was the number they gave? I don't remember. Like, Four billion people have the internet right now? What if everyone did? Wow, what could we accomplish? Let's put weird solar powered planes in the air with internet <laughs> and give it to everyone. <laughs> Everyone's connected. Think about how much we could accomplish. Uh, beautiful, love it, amazing. So uh, that's basically 
the gist of that video <laughs> was the internet for everyone. Which is, I would say, a pretty laudable goal. I, I study the internet. I think the internet has brought a lot of positive, positive things, which is not to say any big change wouldn't have its negative consequences. But um, I would say it's a laudable goal. But if you actually read about this and read about what they're actually planning, it begins to seem a lot more nefarious. <laughs> All right, so the way it actually works, you know, let's be real kids. Um, <laughs> why would Facebook do this? Build these plans, you know, put up this internet thing for everywhere. And the hopes that people use Facebook, that's a pretty good hope. A lot of people use Facebook. Why not? They got money up the wazoo. But if you look at their implementation documents and stuff, it's all public. What is it? It is not giving what we think of as internet access to everyone. It's giving a very restricted suite of network software to people where they only access to the certain services that Facebook wants them to have access to, where um, you know, they only can search on the Facebook search engine and go to the special Facebook website for free. That is the freedom that they're offering everyone, not the internet that did all this stuff that Facebook then laws in their video, not the internet that leads to you know, people connecting spontaneously and creating new things spontaneously without the auspices of some sort of larger organization. So while I would put that the cyborgification is happening for everyone soon, it's not happening equally for everyone. And that is very dangerous indeed. So what this leaves us with is this new opportunity for dialectics, which I have called cyborg dialectics. Where personal, for right now, what we have been kind of bombarded with when it comes to cyborg dialectics is one side, the side from Silicon Valley, from Facebook, from Google, from Mark Zuckerberg, you know, the so-called <laughs> neo-Marxist. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that is a vision of this new cyborg era as one, you know, of, of a new, stronger capitalism, of one with new, greater productivity, new wealth for everyone, and lots more growth, lots more production, lots more of everything. And what they do not harp upon is the new mechanization of people. That is something that they're very, very afraid of. Uh, not of happening, but of the pushback it could be if they kind of really explicitly state that part of their goal. Which you know, just shows, goes to show how much of a neo-Marxist you know, Mark Zuckerberg is. Because if you really understood dialectics, we knew we wouldn't have to worry about people's free cyborg ideologies. <laughs> but, so what this does is this gives us an opportunity to create a new dialectics. I mean, how many of people here have heard of the Internet of Things uh, before today? Less than half of you. Their ideology, it is here, it is everywhere. You know, you read Forbes, what is it? 2014, Forbes declared it the year of the Internet of Things. You know, uh, it's everywhere. It is influencing our culture, but there is still time to put forth our counter ideology. There are contradictions in the capitalist cyborg discourse, mainly mechanization, which is it goes against a lot of their other larger tenets of individual freedom. And so their ideology has this contradiction and it will have to fail. So we have the opportunity to put forth our own new dialectic, one where we embrace mechanization, we understand its positives, we understand you know, what is good about feeling like you have a role in the world? You know, what is, is good about knowing what you have to do to make the world a better place to help your neighbors and to help other people? We can talk about the strength that it gives, the strength that, you know, everyone having access to, you know, be able to learn nuclear physics from Wikipedia can offer. Also, the fluidity that comes from the increasing cyborgification as we take on and discard identities very, very quickly, loosey-goosey, lovely, and also the fact that these systems can be distributed. Um, don't let anyone ever tell you, and you believe them, that we need companies like Facebook, like you know, Bell Communications, or they were then uh, uh, disbanded by an antitrust suit. Um, AT&T came out of that, actually, but they were a major telecommunications uh, company, and they um, did some great stuff, actually, for technology, Bell Labs, a lot of really great work came out of there. But you know that you need these companies, you need these capitalists to bring and give and 
make this infrastructure for this stuff to happen. It's 100% not true, and it's 100% a lie. What we have, in fact, is the networks that have already existed, you know, the ones that you can go home, do your nice little dorm room, and uh, take your computer and plug it into the internet. You know, that, the infrastructure that that connects to was subsidized by governments. Uh, that was already built by the people for the people. These companies are not there. They offer these services. Google offers these services. What, what's the uh, internet service providers? Verizon, Comcast, AT&T, these people, they say they can give you these networks, but we don't need them. Um, how many of you have heard of the One Laptop for Child project? It was this um, thing where they built this cheap laptop. It had, uh, you know, it had a good battery life and very strong. The idea was that it's you, know, you can get a laptop for everyone, you know, distribute this to, you know, poor laptopless kids in other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had this very, I don't think it was, you know, well, who's to say success? I think that company is more or less inoperative. But, you know, they did get these laptops, they had to help people, whatever. What is important for my talk from that is this idea of mesh networks, which if you're familiar with Laptop for Child, maybe you've seen, which is that in these areas where they have no internet, they still want to be able to have networking capabilities. So you have this mesh network where instead of I connect to you know, AT&T servers who then connect me to say you know, um, Oberlin servers, and that's how we communicate, we connect directly. Or if we're far away, I connect to my neighbor's computer who connects to you know, her neighbor's computer, et cetera, et cetera. You have this distributed network, and you don't need these companies. It's there. So uh, that, I think, is an important part of this dialectical thing where we have this material reality in place where these networks exist, they can exist, we have this technology. Instead, we just need to incorporate them into our ideology, how we think about how we use computers, how we want to use computers. We can break away from this dialectic and into our own dialectic. And that is the dialectic, how dialectical materialism can be used with the Internet of Things to come up with a new neo-Marxist framework for a changing world, for a better future, for a better tomorrow, for everyone, all the cyborgs, everyone a cyborg. Uh, that's it. <laughs>